Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another of our Royal Society of Medicine in Conversation Live series. And uh, tonight we're very lucky. We've got a, an excellent guest, uh, a very prestigious guest, Gillian Lang, CBE, who most of you will know uh, is a British health administrator, an academic, and uh, currently chief executive of NICE, only for a short time longer, though, and we'll be talking about that, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, also chair of the Guidelines International Network and a visiting professor at King's College London. She's also, I should say, uh, an ex-valued uh, trustee of the Royal Society of Medicine. Hi, Jill, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Jill, let, let's... Um, I often say these programs are a bit like desert island discs without the discs. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Let's start about a little bit of your history, because I know that you trained at uh, Leeds Hospital. Actually, one of my daughters went there and had, I think she did a degree in parties there because it's so, so famous for its parties, the university. But you did physiology first and then you changed to medicine. So tell us a little bit about your background, why you got into medicine, why you did physiology, then changed to medicine, and um, and and a little bit about kind of where you come from. Yeah, thanks, Roger. Evening, lovely to see you. So, a bit about my story then. Well, I was at school. I was thinking about what to do after I'd got my A levels. I was predicted to get straight A's, which indeed I did. Interested in medicine, so I go to the careers advisor and I say, "I'm thinking of applying to medical school." looked at the subjects that I'd done and said, yes, but you haven't got a physics O level. You won't be able to go to medical school without a physics O level. Didn't mention the fact that they often had foundation courses that I might have done. I was just told fairly categorically I couldn't do medicine. Now, the interesting thing is, why didn't I have a physics O level? Well, my family and I, we'd moved a couple of hundred miles across the country. I'd been at a girls' school. Then I moved to a traditional grammar school a couple of years before O-levels. First day at that school, they lined up the girls and they lined up the boys. And the boys went to do physics and the girls went to do biology. Wow. So that's, that's what happened. And, and I, un I understood later, I probably could have made a fuss. I probably could have got my parents to write to the headmaster and said, she really should do physics. But I was new at the school and it didn't seem the right thing to do. So I had no- Where physics. was that school? Whereabouts? <laughs> it was Harrogate Grammar School. Very good, right. good grammar school, but Pos you know. Posh school in a yeah, posh town, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was lovely in all sorts of ways, but I didn't get a physics. O level. So then I looked at all the subjects that I could study. And you rightly said I had a degree in physiology, but physiology was one subject you couldn't go and study without a physics O level. But I found a bit of a loophole. You could do physiology with a food science combination without the physics O level. So that's what mm. I went to do. And right. I went and I went and I started, I started um, the course. And towards the end of the first year, I still wanted to study medicine. So I go off to the dean and I say, you know, what about changing courses? I'm, I'm doing well at this, I'm doing the physiology, I haven't got physics O level, but I'm managing. And and the response was, well, it's not very easy. It's not very easy to transfer it after a year. It would be much better if you finished your first degree and then you could do medicine after that. So at that point I, I transferred, I did the physiology degree and I go back and I, and I then apply to lots of medical schools. They all offer me places, although they ask me interesting things like, didn't I want a family? Why was I wanting to study? medicine mm. uh, those those sorts of things but i did get there in the end yeah, yeah. and and the, the the of course at that point at that point this was something i wasn't told when um when i first went to ask the dean i wasn't told that having had three years already at university i wouldn't get a grant for the first three years of my medical course and of course in those days we had these lovely things called grants didn't we yeah. so i had to find the money for the first three years of my course and did did you were you, the bank of mum and dad able to help with that or did you have to do lots of holiday jobs and so on and so forth well my parents said they would they would pay but i being an independent soul didn't really want to rely on them my father worked for ici and they had an educational grant scheme so i put in an application to that 
and uh, they funded me for the full three years. So that was uh, that was great, actually. That was yeah, that was very lucky. grateful <laughs> to ICF, and, uh, which now no longer exists, does it? But uh, it and and when looking back over these times, we had Mary Beard in the RSM for um, for lunch just last week, actually, with with Simon, who absolutely loved it, of course. Um, and she was saying that uh, as an academic historian at Cambridge, that uh, she had the same problem. She said that that in that state, I mean, she's quite a bit older than you, of course, you're, you're much younger than she is, but the, the same problems arose that um, it was much, much more difficult to get to the top mm -hmm. as a woman than it was as a, as a man. And of course, you know, Jermaine Greer, the female unit was around and the, the female liberation um, movement was beginning, but it was very nascent then. So, I mean, did, did you, I mean, looking back, were you resentful or how did you handle that? Hmm. I'm not naturally a resentful person, so I I was just pleased I'd got there in the end. And I often felt that I probably got more in a funny sort of way out of my medical course because I'd already had three years I was used to studying. And I, uh, I was more confident in terms of asking questions. You might, you might sort of censor a budding person with interest in evidence because I would ask my senior consultant sometimes you know why, why were they using this drug rather than that one um mm. what what, <laughs> what was informing their choices and and sometimes I would just get told well I use this because that's what that's what I do and you should do what I say <laughs> so I was put back in my box quite often but but yeah <laughs> oh, I can see that. I, I, actually, in my, in my experience, a lot of people who came into medicine having done a different degree, sometimes, you know, arts degree, all sorts of different things, were often turned out to be the best doctors. I think they, they were kind of more, they, they were more mature as medical students and probably in, in messed around less, picked up yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Yeah. So, so, I mean, but, but sort of going back to those early experiences, when I was a house officer I did orthopedics for three months and I worked for three different consultants and they all had different regimes for preventing DVT and that's fine so I had these three lovely little cards in my white coat pocket telling me which each of the consultants regimes were to be um, and the interesting thing was they all said they were evidence-based they all said that they'd followed the evidence so I, I thought they can't all be right. <laughs> there must be a better answer than they've all got different yeah. ones. So, not perhaps a so that was your first experience of clinical variation. Yes, and then, exactly. Then you, then you headed up to Scotland to to Edinburgh. Is that right? Whereabouts? Yes, in Scotland? I did my house jobs at St James's Hospital in Leeds, which was interesting. Just digressing for a moment, Roger, because. Um, they were filming Jimmy's at that point. I don't know if, if, if you remember, it was one of those early fly on the wall sort of docu-soap things. And we we did our house jobs with film crews following us around. It was it was quite strange. But yes, then I went up to then I went up to to Edinburgh and I did some clinical jobs and then I did an MD at Edinburgh University. Right. Well, um, was the, tell us about that MD. Was that in the, the in, to do with evidence-based medicine, etc.? The um, the MD I did had a had a lovely long title called the epidemiology of um, uh, no 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 <laughs> measurement techniques in the epidemiology of peripheral vascular disease I can't remember the name of my own MD it was um, <laughs> so it was a lot about what what tests could you use in a population to detect asymptomatic by and large peripheral vascular disease because peripheral vascular disease is invariably linked with cardiac disease and therefore it's quite a good marker that you're going to be at risk of a heart attack or a stroke so that was that was the work I did as part of the Edinburgh artery study and I created mm -hmm. this 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 uh, questionnaire called the Edinburgh Claudication questionnaire which I still intermittently get emails about saying please can I send them a copy of my Edinburgh Claudic Claudication questionnaire so that that was interesting, interesting times actually in mm -hmm. Edinburgh. I enjoyed that, enjoyed that phase of life. And then headed south after that? Well, not quite. I, I meant to say, because you said, you know, was that linked with the evidence? Well, it gave me a good grounding 
in research. And while I was there in the Wolfson unit for peripheral vascular diseases, Ian Chalmers was establishing, setting up the, the Cochrane collaboration. So of course that was the, the first big initiative, I would say, in, in the UK and in the world for pulling together the evidence that, that we had. So he came up to Edinburgh, he asked my, my boss, Jerry Fawkes, if, um, if he could set up a Cochrane Centre on, on peripheral vascular disease, which, which he agreed to. And I got quite, quite heavily involved in that venture in the Cochrane collaboration and, and indeed have stayed fairly closely linked to the Cochrane collaboration for, you know, un until probably just a couple of years ago when I took up the CEO role. So, so that was my first my first foray into into the evidence and not yeah. everybody will know about the Cochrane lot will um, based in Oxford fantastic organization uh, but just explain a bit more to our viewers and uh, about the Cochrane and, and why it's important Jill yeah yeah very happy to so the the Cochrane collaboration I think it was set up in 1992 named after Archie Cochrane, who famously wrote, famously criticized the medical profession for not systematically pulling together all the knowledge that we have. And therefore, fundamentally, what the Cochrane collaboration was set up to do was to do systematic reviews of evidence on particular topic areas. And, um, and primarily, it was all about randomized controlled trials, um, doing a meta-analysis of those of that data because otherwise you end up you end up rather like my my orthopedic surgeons that I mentioned you might look at one particular trial that gives you one particular answer but as always there's variation and it's not until you pull the results of randomized control trials that you get a much stronger answer that you can be more more confident in and that's what that's what Cochrane did it began very much building on the enthusiasm of people, you know, looking for, for often young clinicians to do this quite detailed technical analysis of data from lots of trials to put them together. Um, nowadays, the models change rather in, it, in its trying to be more systematic and trying to respond to organizations like NICE. So when NICE is doing a guideline, we now work quite closely with Cochrane so that their evidence can feed into can feed into our our guidelines as appropriate yeah and and in those days i mean was were you paid to do that did you get a salary for working or was it just a labor of love like so much of the other things we do including all the work at the rsm of course <laughs> yes uh, there was some core funding for all the Cochrane groups that were set up in different topic areas. They tended to fund somebody to do the searching for trials, somebody to do editing and whatever. But the, the people who were actually doing the reviews and doing the doing the, the work, sifting all the data, they were not paid. And indeed, I don't think people are paid by and large now. I think the model still does still does rely on, on enthusiasm and energy. And of course, it, it you know it's one of those things that you you put it on your CV. You've done a Cochrane review. It's a, it's an important piece of work. Yeah, we'll be talking a lot about evidence and the way that it's sifted and and put together. I, I guess a lot easier now with the powerful computers that we have that that uh, didn't exist uh, mm. way back when. But um, my son is a, is a teacher, and and he says that the, the, the education profession could learn so much from doctors by, or well, the medical profession, by just putting the evidence together because, you know, the evidence for ed the way to improve education in children just isn't there and the different mm -hmm. teachers have different methodologies and so on. Um, so, but, but, but can, I, can I interrupt a minute? No, yeah, yeah. Two, two things about what you've just said. One is powerful computers. And NICE now uses, for some of our work, machine learning. So we use, if you like, artificial intelligence. It, it gets taught a little bit uh, at the beginning by a, by a human being to look for the right trials, but then it learns and it sifts out things from what might be thousands of papers. And, and we use that to make us more efficient. Um, and, but then on the education point, there is one of the What Works centres that the government established called the Education Endowment Foundation. 
that's mm -hmm. got some interesting research. So that might be of interest. Okay, I'll pass that on to that on. <laughs> uh, to, uh, to Joe, my son. There's there's a question come in from Ted Gordon Smith. Ted's a uh, retired, very very uh, eminent hematologist, uh, hemo oncologist, I guess, from St George's, where I used to work. Um, it's a specific question about the recovery trial, and he says, has that changed the way that Nice and others look at evidence? Is uh, what, what what would you say to Ted's question? It's a bit specific, <laughs> I think. Yes, I, I, I can't give you a categorical answer as to whether that one trial has, has changed the way we look at evidence. However, um, we, are, we are on an ongoing basis reviewing our approaches and our methods. It's, it's really, you know, if you look at the span of 20 odd years that NICE has been going, we, we work with international colleagues on on evidence on methods and we are making making ongoing changes to our approaches so uh, yeah i'm sure it's informed some of those changes but i can't give you a categorical answer i'm afraid we'll, we'll come back to you on that we'll get our, our research team to look into that recovery trial it's probably a hematological one actually i bet uh, but no uh, as, a, as a humble urologist i don't know what the recovery trial is either um okay jill let's go back to so now you're up in scotland where uh, the temperatures can be, drop sometimes in the winter uh yeah. but it's a most wonderful city beautiful place edinburgh what when did you head south again then uh, having done your md and where did you go to um when I headed south um doesn't matter exactly just before it? just 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 towards the year the year 2000 just towards the end of the end of the cent century <laughs> and at that point i'd begun my formal training in public health so um i moved down south and finished that training and i got a, and i kept an academic link you know having done my md at edinburgh university all the subsequent jobs i did i managed to do them part-time maintaining that academic input which i i thought was really important it it, it it mattered to me and that's what i did when i moved south and then i got a consultant job at uh, bedfordshire health authority consultant in public health with an academic link at the royal free that was great but then i saw that that that, that this organization called nice had been set up and I saw this job being advertised, the programme director for guidelines to set up NICE's new guideline programme. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> that appeals to me. I'd really like to do that. I mentioned it to some colleagues who, who actually were, were rather less than encouraging. They sort of heard about the politics behind NICE and thought, thought it wasn't going to work, thought it was high risk, but I thought, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to give it a go. So I applied for the job and was fortunate enough to to be appointed. And then I was tasked with setting up the approach that NICE then used for developing our clinical guidelines. And yeah, the early days were interesting. You know, I remember I remember working with the Royal Colleges because we had six Royal Colleges all involved in the development of guidelines and getting the first one published was exciting it was the guideline on schizophrenia and we predicted we predicted in those early days of developing guidelines that we might have about 50 a portfolio of 50 guidelines and even that felt rather like a textbook of medicine I remember Mike Rawlins saying to me you know is that what we're doing is that what NICE is doing we're writing a new textbook of medicine but of course, we've now got about 400 guidelines, wow. which is a massive, massive undertaking. It is it is the biggest, um, the gu biggest guideline developer in, in the world, as far as I'm aware, because they're, they're, they're huge pieces of work. But that's given us that's giving a, given us a, a problem in itself. It's a success, but it's also a challenge because of keeping them up to date. You know, I sometimes rather jokingly say but it's true that that a guidelines for life it's not just for christmas you know once we develop it we are then tasked with keeping it up to date and therein lies the main challenge and therein is part of the focus of nice's new strategy that was published last year which is to say look people seem to want living guidelines 
that's the direction of travel around the world. You know, you can't do a guideline, wait five years, decide to update it and another five, you know, you've got, you've got to keep them up to date. So part of the work moving forwards is to prioritize the really core, most important parts of that big portfolio and, and then put them into a digital form that means they can be updated really quickly and genuinely be a living guideline. Mm -hmm. And which, which is the most controversial of the guidelines, uh, those 400 guidelines? Which is the one that, caught, that got you most kind of kickback from the doctors? I remember some of the prostate ones were, were quite controversial when I was uh, busy removing people's prostates, which I no longer do. Well, <clears throat> it's probably true to say that most guidelines have got some bits of controversy, some more than others. Uh, and I, and I could mention at this point the guideline on, on ME, but I'm not going to use that example. I want to use an example that goes back quite a long time. It was the first guideline we did on fertility treatment. So it was, it was a big piece of work. The, the inequalities around access to IVF still exist. But when we did the first guideline on fertility treatment, it was very much hoped that because of the additional funding going into the health service, because of the government's commitment to this topic, it was going to be an opportunity to, to level up, if you like, to make sure everyone could have access to IVF. So we did this massive piece of work. It went out for consultation. And the reason I, I'm using it as an example is because it's the only time, even now, I can remember when we had a massive, massive number of comments from the general public. Most, most guidelines, we get comments from professional groups and patient organisations, but here was a general public response saying that they didn't think, they didn't think the NHS should pay for fertility treatment. It was, it was very, very surprising. So it was not a supportive response. But of course, you know, it, it, it wasn't our decision as to whether or not fertility treatment should be funded on the NHS or not. You know, it, it was, it was part of the NHS offer. The government had asked us to do this topic, but uh, that was a very interesting response. And it was, it was inevitably uh, a controversial topic when it was published. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, I can understand, um, how you put all the evidence together, especially with your supercomputers and so on. But then the, the, the working out whether they're financially viable, whether, whether the, the quality of life impact of the, of the treatment, that must be a whole lot more difficult, really. And uh, to explain how you, you fit the finance into the, 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 all the uh, concatenation of all the medical evidence. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, there's there's two there's two two bits of thinking about the money. There's the first decision, which is whether or not it's it's cost effective. Is it is it value for money? Then there's all that decision making, and then the second bit that we now look at in a way that we didn't when Nice was first started, which is to say okay, it's value for money, but how much is it actually going to cost? <laughs> and how quickly can we put it into practice if it costs more than, than the NHS is likely to be able to afford in the coming year? So, so the bit about value for money, which is particularly part of the work that we do looking at new drugs, um, we, we, look at, we look at the quality adjusted life year uh, and without going into a lecture on, on health economics, it's a way of combining the added years of life that you get from a treatment and the added quality of life and looking at how much you pay for that. And the benefit of looking at a quality is that you can compare different treatments using the same approach. Um, and, and that's central to the evaluation of new drugs, but it's not, it's not the only thing that we take into account. We also listen to, to patient feedback. We look at whether there are other treatments available. Uh, at the moment, we look at end of life and we look at whether or not um, something is going to help people in the last few months of their, their life because that gets an added value, if you like. So there's, there's, there's complicated 
there's complicated economics, complicated modeling that goes into that can't be underestimated because we often don't have much data. We might have data, say, for the next one or two years, but we need to predict, the model needs to say what the value for, for money would be in a, on a 10 year horizon to know if it's going to be, to be worthwhile paying for or not. So there, there's lots of complicated bits, but it start at the heart of it, it's got the cost per quality, it's got a consultation and, and, um, and that, that's, that's how we will decide whether or not it looks like it's value for money. If it isn't, if it, if it doesn't look like it's value for money, there is now an opportunity for a company to come back with a, a discount. It's always a commercial discount for the NHS and that gets discussed with NHS England. And we can then put that back into the model and it might make it affordable with that NHS discount. So that, that is a, a really, uh, a really important benefit of the way that we work with NHS England. Um, so so that, that, that's a way of bringing costs down for the NHS. And the second thing is about that uncertainty that I mentioned. Because we've had for the past few years, the Cancer Drugs Fund, people might be, be familiar with, with the, that, or at least the basic concept of the Cancer Drugs Fund. And if, if there's a, a cancer drug where there's uncertainty, but probably it's likely to work, it looks like it's plausible, but we haven't got enough data, we can recommend that it goes into the Cancer Drugs Fund for a couple of years to allow more data to be collected, and then we can take a look at it. And it's great because it allows, you know, it allows patient access during that, during that period and potentially provides some benefit rather than there being an initial no. So I think, I think that's been a really good mechanism. It's again, a joint work between NICE and NHS England. And you know, listeners might be, be aware that that's going to be converted shortly into something called an innovative medicines fund. Mm -hmm. So again, a, a good, a positive move because instead of it just being cancer drugs, it will be any, anything, uh, for any condition provided there's that uncertainty and a data collection mechanism we've got loads of questions coming in i will get to them but i think uh, uh, just a few from me before that i mean you were there at the beginning with with mike rawlins and then you handed he handed over to andrew dillon and andrew and i used to work together at st george's as i mentioned um i mean when mike first was involved in it i, I suppose he was the sort of driver for it in a way or they hired him to to drive it um, but you know, it wasn't trusted initially, was it? But I think you do have trust now. Yeah. And you have an international reputation. Lots of countries say, I wish we had it nice and your guidelines are international as well as national. So just talk a little bit about, I mean, trust is in the news at the moment. Not everybody seems to trust our current, um, uh, politicians, for example, without getting into that. Um, so tr trust and nice d d do, the, does the public trust you? Do the profession trust you? Uh, and, and how, if they do, how have you built that position? Well, we run a, a regular thing called a, a reputation tracker so that we get feedback from our key audiences, be that the general public or clinicians or um, politicians. We, we get that feedback and, and yes, we are, we are trusted. We are we score well compared with other arms length bodies and, and, and other organizations. And that's, that's really great to see, but you're right. You know, you can't, you can't just expect to be trusted. You have to earn it. And I wasn't at NICE for the first year or so, but I, I do remember seeing from afar the initial decision made. I think it was about a, a drug, wasn't it? For, for flu. And that, that was, that was tricky and people were saying oh nobody's ever going to trust this nice no one's ever going to trust nice but by and large i think people do they don't always like the decisions that we make it has to be said but our approach is one of openness and transparency so many of our committee meetings are held in public all our methods and processes 
and manuals and the evidence base, you know, it, it's on the website and can be accessed. So I think that openness is a core bit, a core bit to being trusted. If you've got the, the black box approach and nobody knows what's going on around your decision making, it's really difficult, I think. It's really difficult. So there's a question here. Do, do the politicians try and interfere with your decisions? Are you really independent um, as an entity? Mm. What would you say to that? <laughs> we are independent. We have independent advisory committees. I, I wonder if any of the people listening have been on any of our committees because we involve a, a huge, a huge number of of, of clinicians on those committees and some of them give us dedicated de dedicated input for years and years and years on end and it's it's I'm really grateful have to take this opportunity to say that NICE could not work without those advisory committees they are independent and they um they they take the difficult decisions on our behalf in relation to what the evidence says, what they think of the cost effectiveness modeling, whether they think somebody should be recommending, re recommended or not, subject of course to consultation. And that consultation is part of being trusted. And you've inevitably seen headlines, I'm sure that says, nice makes a U-turn. Well, I've, I've always thought, I've always been quite proud of the U-turns, to be honest, because these decisions are never black and white. They're not easy. And if you get a lot of opinions, a lot of views that say that it's, it's not right and we listen and we change our minds, I think that's a good thing, not a negative U-turn. So, um, so do, do politicians try, I think with the emphasis on, on try to, to influence us, I I couldn't possibly comment. However, we are independent and we go through our work and it's open and you can see the decisions uh, on the website. So John Hickman, this is a slightly challenging question. With regard to trust and transparency, can you comment on why there's been an increase in data redaction at NICE? <laughs> is that true? <laughs> uh, do you have more data redaction? I, I I didn't know that we had more data re redaction, so I, I can ask the team. Data is redacted. It's usually something that happens in our technology appraisal program specifically. Mm -hmm. That is where there are commercially sensitive bits of data. So I mentioned earlier, didn't I, that, that sometimes when we don't think something's value for money, the company can come back with a commercially confidential uh, arrangement for the NHS. So that data has to be redacted. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, we are looking at more drugs. So it may be that there's, there's simply more volume. Um, commercial, that, 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 would, that would make sense. James Cochran, I don't know whether he's li linked to the Cochran, <laughs> is saying it's generally accepted that the cost of equality is below £25,000 for an intervention. It could be recommended as good value for money. Well, what's the evidence that 25,000 is the right cutoff value? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good question. I like that question. Um, when NICE started, we were not given any sort of threshold. We had, we had a blank sheet of paper, really. Uh, and so following the work of the advisory committees, they developed, if you like, case law. And by looking at where the decisions were being taken, what, what was the level of, of cost per quality that the committees felt was worth a, a yes decision or a no decision, it became clear that there was this sort of threshold range between 20 and 30 where those difficult decisions were sitting. Above 30 was generally a no, below 20 was generally a yes, and then there was a a grey area in between where different factors had to be taken into account. So it, it evolved in that way. Of course, it has changed a little bit. I mentioned end of life. So if you've got something that's, uh, that is specifically aimed at people who are you know, sadly approaching end of life, then that threshold range is higher. It also goes up again if it's a product that's for a very, very small group of patients highly specialized technologies. So there's, there's really quite, quite a, a range. But is it right you know, to answer your question? 
in general, is that 20 to 30 range, is that right? There was a piece of work done five years or so by an economist called Carl Claxton, and his, his theoretical work looking at all sorts of different things that he used in the NHS concluded that the cutoff should be lower. It was concluded it should be round about 13, 14,000 pounds per quality, I think. And there was a lot of debate and discussion around that. Did that mean NICE should change its, its approach? And on balance, because we've consulted on our methods, it was decided that no, we should stay with the range that we have um, and, that, and that's what's happened. However, however, it hasn't gone up in line with inflation. There's a question from Professor David Crosdale Apple. Um, oh yes, I know David, yep. Yep, he, he, he says, Jill, given yes. that we've recently included evidence on educational subjects, do you see this component of NICE's programme of guideline development moving significantly further in the future? What, what's, what would you say to that? I, I would really like it to. I would really like it to is, is all I can say, because I think we've done some great work largely within our, our public health programme, which, which David supports, chairs one of our committees. However, however, as I mentioned earlier, we've got this massive portfolio of guidelines and unless there's a magic money tree somewhere, we're going to have to prioritise what, what we do. And I'd love it, you know, I'd really love it to have to have some additional funding to do more in the educational space, because I think I think there's a, a big opportunity there. I'm going to ask you one more specific question, then, then I want to come on to, to Paul and, and what you're going to do, because um you're leaving just in a, what 10 days time or something like that or less than yeah, that yeah, aren't you? not long not long not long so angela um who helps us so much at the rsm really wonderful member of the rsm says thank you for all the wonderful work you do we use them so regularly the guidelines could you say something about the impact of what you did on screening for an aortic aneurysms mm. <laughs> that, a bit specific maybe yeah no that that's fine that's fine uh, it was quite a while ago, the work on, on aortic aneurysms, there, and there's two pieces to this, really. One was a systematic review, a Cochrane review, even, on screening for aortic aneurysms that I did with my husband, Paul. He'd never done a systematic review, and I was being my classic advocate, you know, this is really good, everybody should do a Cochrane review. So. I persuaded him to do to do the first Cochrane review on on screening for aortic aneurysms, and it was a joint publication. Although he did he did more of the writing than I did, it has to be said. And then many many years later, of course, um, you know, Nice gets involved in in a aortic aneurysm work as well. So it was good to see it coming through in that way as well. Mm -hmm. I say Barbara Robinson. Thank you, Barbara. A couple of questions. I think she's writing on behalf of the ME community, and you can guess what the question's going to be. It's about uh, the guideline 205. She says, uh, it's a tough call for you during a very difficult uh, year. What do you hope will be the outcome uh, of, of that guideline? Uh, I know it's very controversial, or has been. Yes. Yeah, well, I... I, I just to rehearse some of the background in case pe people aren't aware, it, it's, it, it was a controversial guideline originally. We, we produced the original guideline on, on ME, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, was it? And, and it's recently been updated. And because there were some controversial, not, not so much controversial, different views on, on the recommendations. We paused publication of the guideline. That was very controversial, but I felt personally quite strongly that we shouldn't put out a guideline into such an environment where there were so many different perspectives on whether or not we'd got it right. I, I really wanted to pull the various people together to have a conversation, to listen to the person who'd chaired that committee, to understand why the recommendations had been made as they were, why they had been changed, uh, how we'd handle the evidence, all those things. 
so we we did that we had a very good meeting with patient groups with representatives from the royal colleges and and then we we published it and i my aim of having that meeting was about supporting implementation supporting change so i, I really hope that it is used as a genuine patient centered guideline where clinicians can use it with patients to talk about the options and to understand what the evidence says and what might be appropriate for individuals because it's clearly a condition where 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 people where, where it varies that's what i'm that's what i'm trying to say different people have different experiences and and having patient centered approach to management is really what i'd like to see and, and I suppose there'll be overlap, overlap with long COVID and, and uh, ME and chronic fatigue syndrome. Will, yes. will, you need a, will you need a long COVID guideline, do you think? Or? Well, Roger, we've already got a long COVID guideline. Oh, <laughs> we've already got a long COVID guideline. It, was, it wasn't the first one that we did, obviously, but, but it's, it's there and it's being regularly updated. Uh, these are indeed, our portfolio of COVID guidelines are yeah. very much... Um, very much living guidelines because the evidence base is, is growing so rapidly. Will there be an overlap between long COVID and ME? I suspect there will be some, and it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if, if research into long COVID throws some light on, on some of the, uh, the background, some of the causes of, of ME as well. I don't know if it will, but it would be good if there's a read across. Yeah. I better rush rush off and read those as soon as I get off the <laughs> yes, program. I so, so that there are eleven more questions, and we will come back to them. But I wanted to focus a little bit on you and your difficult year um, because of the sad death, premature death of your wonderful husband, uh, Sir Paul Cosford. I mean, is it difficult for you to talk about that, Jill, or do you want to? Would you be happy? No, I'm, to I'm very happy to to talk about it. it I mean, lots of people have had difficult times, haven't they, during the pandemic, and and it was it was difficult for for both both of us in a way. I'd not long taken over as the chief exec, and suddenly I was running an organisation working from home. It it wasn't ideal, and and my husband, because he came into the at risk category, was was really um, told to shield. And he wasn't at all happy about that. He wasn't at all happy about that at all because he knew he had limited time and he wanted to be able to go out and do things and use the time as best he could. And he really wanted to be able to contribute um, in sort of face-to-face -face meetings in relation to, to managing COVID. And he did lots. He did an absolute you know, he, heap of, of input to the COVID pandemic from home, but he would have liked to have been more, more active if he was able to. And of course, during that phase, he sadly gets, he sadly gets worse. He, we should just tell the, the listeners, uh, viewers, that he had a form of lung cancer, non-smoker, but um, developed a lung cancer, right? Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I, sh I should have said that as well, shouldn't I? I sort of so used to talking about it, I assume everybody knows, which of course, which of course they won't. Yes, he, he, had, he had lung cancer, and there's a link back to what I was saying before about uncertainty. He... He was actually on one of those drugs that was in the Cancer Drugs Fund, and it it gave him really good quality of life for about two years. But it was quite an eye opener for me to really understand what living with uncertainty is like from the patient perspective. You know, I was used to understanding what it's like for a committee, looking at graphs, trying to work out which direction the you know the curve's going to go in. But when you're actually a patient experiencing uncertainty, not knowing how long this drug is going to last, it's really, really difficult. And I used to say it feels like being on death row. You know, you know you've got a terminal illness, but you're just waiting for this drug to stop working. And it, and it was really, 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 really hard. So sadly, he, he, he got worse. He ended up having a series of pulmonary emboli and and he died on the 5th of april last 
year. So we were still in that phase of restricted funerals, which again, I'm sure a lot of people have, have experienced during the last year. So I, my husband had been a really keen cyclist and I realized that, that you could hire things called, called um, oh yeah, I forgot the name of it. They, a tandem, that's it, a tandem hearse. You could hire a tandem hearse. So you get two burly men on a bicycle and the coffin goes by the side of the tandem. And I, I hired that to transport Paul to the church. But alongside that, I, uh, I asked lots of friends, neighbors, colleagues, if they wanted to cycle to the church, because of course that was okay. It was, in, in, you know, it was outside in the fresh air. People couldn't all come to the church, but we ended up on this glorious, sunny day with a red kite flying overhead and Paul always loved the red kites in our village and all these people cycling to church with Paul and and that was quite amazing actually it was quite amazing. A very fitting goodbye to a wonderful person and um, the the Paul was of course very influential in, in public health England so I, I was going to ask you about the political decision to uh, to uh, pull apart Public Health England and create the National Security Agency, which sounds like a sort of uh, MI5 uh, uh, substitute, really. But uh, just tell, tell us about that. And I mean, what, what did Paul think about that? that? That I think it was Matt Hancock must have made that decision before um, he uh, bit the dust, as it were. Mm. Well, it, it's interesting because Paul and I did, did talk about this a lot because my husband's job title at Public Health England was Medical Director and Director of Health Protection. And health protection is the bit that is about managing pandemics, about managing communicable diseases, about managing emergency uh, preparedness and scenarios like, like the uh, scripple poisonings. So all, all of those things that are about keeping the population safe, health protection, he was interested in and he was involved in all sorts of all sorts of work uh, relevant to that including the Ebola outbreak and that is what's meant by the health security agency so I think Paul was was supportive of having an organization with a focus on those areas of work and it's it isn't until you have something like a pandemic or some you know, some some big outbreak of communicable diseases that you realize you realize that that the work that we do that that the country does that all the experts in that field do are, are really important to keep us safe sometimes say it's a bit it's a bit like you know, being immunized most of us wouldn't ever think would we about diphtheria or some of those uh, some of those infectious diseases that feel long gone you have your you have your immunization and then you don't think about it and you don't think about what the country does to protect us against those things until something goes wrong so he he would have been supportive and and, and just quickly because we haven't got that much time um just to mention that we're uh, you and and with our help at the rsm are organizing a memorial service for paul on the 5th of april which will be the uh, anniversary of uh, of his passing so we've got yeah. some very influential speakers there so anybody that is interested if you contact us at the rsm we'll give you some more information about that mm -hmm. um do you think that i mean that, this is a very broad question about the way that covid has been handled in in the uk i mean we saw some of us including me saw the prime minister squirming a bit today in um, in that in the house of commons and you know there's been a lot of criticism about the politics of COVID but do you think you know looking back with all the guidelines that you know about and obviously I don't know about um, I should uh, do you think that basically they've got it right or do you think that you know the 150 or is it maybe 170,000 people in the UK have, some of them have died unnecessarily if different actions have been taken what's what's your view on that <clears throat> I don't think I can comment on whether whether overall our response was was right or not, but I I know there's going to be an inquiry, isn't there? So at some point we will we will see that we'll see the comparison. Um, but I do know because of Paul's involvement early on that that 
the people were taking the decisions that they felt were right at the time you know and and it's i often say <clears throat> i often say you know the evidence is never black and white if if it were it would be easy wouldn't it it would be easy you wouldn't need nicest committees to look at the evidence if it told us the answer and i know there's been this often used phrase we follow the science and absolutely people have looked at the science but the science has only been able to give you so much of a perspective there've been that uncertainty in the future what's going to happen and people have made the decisions to the best of their ability in the information that they had and people have taken different decisions in different countries and you know who am i who am i to judge who am i to judge well we'll wait for the for the uh, inquiry quite right so richard balleran thank you richard internationally nice is often viewed as the crown jewel of the nhs how is its vanguard role being used to raise standards in health technology assessment generally not just nationally um so so how how are we helping to improve things internationally yeah, as well as nationally yeah well we we have lots and lots of international links there are um, <clears throat> any number of international collaborations around health technology assessment which of which we are part we used to do an awful lot with something called UNETA, the European Health Technology Assessment Network. And we're aiming to keep European links going, but sadly we can't be part of UNETA. We work closely with other countries like Canada, Singapore, Australia. Um, and and we, you know, it, it's, it's a network of people. And I was really gratified uh, a month or so ago to talk to some colleagues in America who said, you know, everybody's really impressed with what you're doing at NICE. You're leading the world on the assessment of digital technologies. And that was lovely to hear because actually how you assess digital technologies is really quite challenging. So um, I, I, I'm absolutely sure we haven't cracked that, but it's but we're working hard. We're working hard with colleagues on the best way to do that. And, and you know, it's a small world now, isn't it? We need to work with colleagues and learn from them. Mm -hmm. John Conway is asking uh, about when NICE decide to review guidelines in the light of new evidence, which must be cropping up all the time, is there a specific protocol all reviews follow, uh, such as a time scale for various stages, or does it depend on the individual guideline being reviewed? <clears throat> well, we've got, we've got a a protocol for assessing regularly assessing the evidence and then we take a look at the likely impact of that evidence and that does that does vary in terms of the impact that we think it might have and the importance in terms of how quickly we do it and how much work it can be but moving forwards to that concept that i described of living guidelines we really want to be able to update things much more swiftly and part of doing that if anybody out there is interested in being on our committees part of doing that is to have some standing committees on core topic areas be that cancer cardiovascular disease mental health so, so that we've got people already in place on a committee who can help us see the impact of new evidence as it comes through so we can update recommendations as quickly as possible. So there's variation at the moment, but in future, this, the, the, it, won't be, it won't be like that. Okay, well, if, if this was to the Today programme, I, I guess they'd say you're leaving at the end of this month. So why are you leaving and what are you going to do next, Jill? You don't have to answer that if you don't want to. <laughs> no, no, I don't mind. I don't mind. Why am I leaving? Well, I've been at NICE for <clears throat> 20 years and seven months. Not, not that I'm counting, but 20 years and seven months. It's, it's a long time. And, you know, having taken over the chief exec role, I've had all the pandemic to deal with, and we've done some fantastic work, I think, around guidelines for, for, for COVID. We've produced a new strategy. We've done a review of methods and processes. And in amongst all of that, you know, sadly my husband died and it was really, you know, it, 
it wasn't very easy. <laughs> it's a good bit of British understatement at that point, I think. Yeah. And and I, you just reevaluate life, don't you? And it felt like it felt like it was the right time with the new strategy, with all of those things, to move on. And I've often said to to people that I really felt I couldn't live the life I'd had with Paul without him, and that I need to do different things. So that's so that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. So I'm retiring from Nice, but I'm not going to retire from work i've got um a few things that i'm going to to do in the short term but i'm also look looking at options shall we say looking at options and and in the next few months there'll be a bit more clarity about what i shall do well we're definitely hoping to rope you into the royal society of medicine again get re-rope re you into the yeah, uh, rope me in. That'll be, that'll be tell, tell us a little bit about your successor you you said to me when few weeks ago you thought she was terrific so just to give us a little bit of an insight into who's taking over yeah the person taking over is called uh, Dr Sam Roberts and she has worked in um, Australia and she has worked in the UK where I met her was when she was the chief exec of something called the Accelerated Access collaborative or or the AAC for short and that is an organization part of NHS England that that, that does what it says in the tin on the tin really it's it's about improving access to for patients to proven health technologies and their therein is the obvious link with nice you know we've done an evaluation of what's good value and the AAC has been helping to uh, to improve uptake so so that's how I've got to know her. She knows nice. She knows nice pretty well. She knows her way around the quali. So so I'm sure she'll do a fantastic job. And um, I've been I've been doing lots of handover. And uh, right. yeah, so she starts um, next Tuesday. All good luck to her on Tuesday. And, and I often ask at the end of these programs that this question about, I mean, what are you most proud of? If you look back over the, your, your life and your work and so on, um, defining moments and your kind of proudest moment, Jill, proudest mm -hmm. achievement, what would you say? You've done a lot of good things, so it's hard to yeah. sift them out. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 think, I think that the guidelines program at NICE, I was very closely involved in how it got set up. <clears throat> I wrote the first manual for developing NICE guidelines. And uh, yeah, I, I, I actually think it, it, they, NICE guidelines have had a significant impact on the way we work in the UK, but also around the world. You know, some people have mentioned, haven't they, that NICE's international impact. And you go abroad, and it's it's quite humbling to see that you know Italy has taken our schizophrenia guideline and they've done a fantastic job of putting it into into practice and mm. and I think gosh <laughs> gosh they've done a really good job um, yeah so that it's that uh, that's a fitting uh, thing to say I think that's why they call you Jill Guidelines Lang I suppose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> out there in the wide world <laughs> jill thank you so much and uh all good luck yeah we'll be looking uh, uh, with great interest in in your next move i mean uh, we live in a turbulent world don't we now and you can see the nhs is going to have to change in all sorts of different ways mm -hmm. um we've got maybe have i got one minute left one minute left in oh, terms yeah. of do you think <laughs> Um, it's a very broad question again. The, do you think the NHS over the next five, ten years can survive as it is, or is it going to have to undertake absolutely major changes? That's a really, what, yeah. That's a really easy question to finish on. Roger. That's a really easy question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, well, I mean, what I, I have meant to ask said, you earlier. Actually. <laughs> what I have said is that if you look at how the NHS has developed and evolved, I mean, it does so much now compared with when it was set up in fact there wasn't much was there in the way of effective treatments if we look back at when the nhs was set up you know you can reflect on dr finley and think well he didn't do very much but we didn't have the effective treatments we didn't have the inter effective interventions the cancer drugs the you know the um the the kidney 
dialysis. They're all sorts of things we didn't have. So thinking of how the NHS has evolved to take all of that on is quite remarkable. However, what I think has happened during the pandemic has been the biggest sort of single hit, a, a phase shift, if you like, in what the NHS had to do. I think that's the biggest, biggest single impact that it's had to deal with. And the recovery from that pandemic is going to be a challenge. And there are all sorts of different ways that it might come out of it and might be able to catch up and, and all the rest. But um, I am a fan of the NHS, so I will do what I can in my work after NICE to help make it a continued success. Well, I think on that note, we better leave it there. So yeah, the, nobody knows what the future holds. Maybe we'll have to get you back for another hour and then we could go through all those questions <laughs> as well. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, for your questions. Fantastic. Uh, sorry I didn't get to answer them all. Don't go away yet, Jill, because I've got a few announcements to make. Um, on uh, Wednesday, the 2nd of February, we've got uh, David Halpern on In Conversation from the Behavioural Insight Team. Our wonderful uh, Henrietta uh, Bowden, Joseph, is going to be uh, asking him uh, questions. Uh, the day after that, we've got Je Sir Jeremy Farrer, um, uh, author of that excellent book, Spike, uh, director of the Wellcome Trust. That's going to be really, really interesting. The following Wednesday, uh, we have uh, um, uh, Rear Admiral Andy Kyle from the Navy, and he was involved in shifting PPE equipment around the uh, UK and shipping it in from all over the world. So I'd be interested to, to talk about that. And on the 17th of, of March, we're going to get Jill back again, along with a lot of other really interesting people to talk about assisted dying. Uh, the practical exploration of that. And it's not going to be an ethical uh, debate. It's going to be more about the practical issues of it. And of course, Jill um, has experienced aspects of that, sadly, in the last year or so. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, I think we've had more than 600 people tuning in tonight. I'm so proud that uh, people want to still watch these uh, in conversations. A couple of years now we've been running them. So uh, Jill, thank you. Have a wonderful evening and good luck in your next career. We'll be looking to see where you go next. Bye for now. Bye.